Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 424th episode, we have two new dinosaurs. Sabrina has a sauropod. Yes. And I have a hadrosaur. <laughs> Not an ankylosaur, unfortunately. <laughs> Are you disappointed if it's... Unless it's an ankylosaur. Well, when you have a sauropod, I feel like I should have an ankylosaur. Well, but there are so many more sauropod discoveries than ankylosaurs that it doesn't usually work out that way. Yep. I think I still have a few more sauropods to cover. <laughs> probably, yeah. And they're probably all from like three vertebrae or something. No. Some that's unfair. <laughs> we also have a dinosaur connection challenge, and I'm going to be connecting dinosaurs to Titanic. Hmm. It's one of Garrett's favorite movies. Well, yeah. And the whole, the Titanic as a ship was like one of the first really impressive engineering feats I learned about as a kid. But then it's also obviously a huge tragedy. So like the the whole story of how it went wrong, how many things had to go wrong, all that stuff was fascinating to me as a kid because, you know, you don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. Is it extra fascinating when you tie it back to dinosaurs? Yes, I went down some really, I think, interesting rabbit holes that consumed hours of my time, <laughs> but I'll get into that later. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Silosaurus. That's a that's a big name. Yeah. They got a whole group of the Silosaurids named after them. I know, and a lot of changes around that group happening. Oh, yeah, because they're very recently now dinosaurs, right? Spoilers. I guess it's not really a spoiler. We covered that <laughs> news item a while ago. <laughs> Well, it's a good thing you're covering it. Yeah. That it's officially a dinosaur. We've covered dinosaurs in the past that turned out not to be dinosaurs. That's true. Yeah. Sometimes there's a little gray area with the dinosaur morphs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Good point. And of course, we have a fun fact. And this week, it's about all the places you can and can't find hadrosaurs. (laughs) Spoiler alert, you can find them almost anywhere, but not everywhere. There is a continent that doesn't have them. But I'll, I'll wait till the fun fact to reveal which continent it is. All and right. it might not be the one you expect. A little tease there. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me think it's not. We'll get into it. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get into all of that, we want to thank our patrons for helping to keep our podcast running. And this week, we'd like to thank Remy Rodriguez, DC Cassandra, Bruce, and Kyla Salas, James Pasco, Danny Hermes, Chris, Melina and Manoli, the Georges family, and Taya. Thank you so much for being part of our community of dino dolls. And again, if you're at the Triceratops level or above, make sure you've updated your addresses so we can send you that patch. Jumping into the news, I get to start today. Yeah, I think your discovery was a little better than mine. Yeah, it's a sauropod. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you because I have a hadrosaur. <laughs> I think sauropods are cooler than hadrosaurs. Oh, hadrosaurs are cool. We did do our, one of our milestone episodes all about hadrosaurs. Their teeth are very cool. That's their thing. Yeah. They're like innovation where those dental batteries with hundreds of teeth, they're pretty awesome. This, the whole snout in general. Mm-hmm. And then some of them have the crests. Very true. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot going on there. Good point. And so there's some of the early finds. So. I shouldn't be so down on hadrosaurs. You really right. shouldn't. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but back to the sauropods. So <laughs> there is a new macronarian sauropod, Eugolong churinensis, and this was published in Royal Society Open Science by Hui Dai and others. And it's an early neosauropod macronarian. So it lived in the Middle Jurassic and what is now Sichuan, China, in the Shashimiao Formation. And what's cool about it is it helps show that sauropods were more diverse and they lived in more parts of the world in the Middle Jurassic than we previously thought. Yeah, that's pretty early. Yeah. For a true neosauropod, like the the real sauropods, not just the sauropodomorphs like Pladiosaurus and stuff. Yeah, it, it looked, because it's a neosauropod, it looked like what you'd think of sauropods looking like with the long neck and the long tail, walking on four legs. And being a macronarian, it had a large nasal opening. Yeah, that's what macronarian means, like macro, big nares <laughs> for <laughs> nose opening. Yeah, that's, so that's what they're known for, the large nasal opening in their skulls, which are bigger than their orbits where the eyes were. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. Bigger nose holes than <laughs> than eye, eye holes. holes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then, of course, neosauropods are known for being large and having the long necks and those columnar legs. And neosauropods, we kind of know, but just to be safe, that includes Brachiosaurus, Argentinosaurus, Patagotitan, Apatosaurus, those kinds of animals. Yeah, I think it's also helpful with macronarians and lots of dinosaur groups to think of what they aren't. And macronarians are the sister group to diplodocids. Mm -hmm. So the diplodocids have that big tail and you know what diplodocids look like. Dippy. Macronarians are the other ones. <laughs> the ones with the big nasal openings. <laughs> yeah. But like Camarasaurus and Titanosaurus are macronarians. Yes. So the fossils of Yu Zhou Long were found in 2016, and they found a partial skeleton of a subadult, including part of the skull and brain case, part of the jaw, tail vertebrae, parts of the shoulder and rib, parts of the leg and arm bones. Some of these fossils are still buried in the quarry where they were found. Oh, really? Yeah. So I think there might be more work to be done. I mean, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the type of species is Yujolong churiensis, and the genus name refers to the ancient name of Chongqing in Chinese, and the species name comes from the name of the ancient Yunyang County. And there's some unique features in these fossils. It gets pretty detailed. It's things like the back neural spine closest to the neck is bifurcated. Oh, yeah. Bifurcated neural spines are always interesting. It's like two points sticking off the top rather than just the one. Yeah. Like our backs have. Exactly. Like most sauropods have. Yeah, at least at some point. Yeah. <laughs> some parts. Yeah. They don't all have it in the back neural spine closest to the neck. I can tell you that much right now. <laughs> <laughs> The other sauropods have been found in the lower Shashi Miao formation where Yu Zhou was found. That includes Shunosaurus, Omeisaurus, Abrosaurus, last week's dinosaur of the day, if that name rings a bell, Dashampusaurus, Datosaurus, Bashunosaurus. There's a lot there. Not very many household names, though, other than maybe Omeisaurus. I feel like that one might be a little more well known. I think Shunosaurus. Oh, true. Yeah. There's a debate still on how macronarians originated and their early diversification and dispersal where they ended up. So there are a lot of neosauropods in the late Jurassic, like diplodocids. Neosauropods, however, they weren't globally distributed in the middle Jurassic, at least compared to the late Jurassic. So this find of Yu Zhoong help show that they started populating more of Earth, quote, as early as the late early Jurassic. Late early Jurassic. Yeah. Which, since the Jurassic doesn't have even time periods, you know, the early Jurassic is the longest one, mm -hmm. puts it sort of right in the middle of the Jurassic, like 175-ish million years ago, which is pretty old. I mean, that's like 20 million years older than Dinosaur National Monument and a lot of those dinosaurs out there, which were fairly early sauropods. Mm -hmm. Now we got earlier ones. <laughs> so Yu Zhoong, it helps show more how neosauropods originated and again their early diversification, having more different types of neosauropods in the middle Jurassic than we thought before. And it undermines the idea of the East Asia isolation hypothesis, E-A-I-H. <laughs> Oh, I didn't realize it was important enough to have its own acronym. I saw the acronym and then, yeah, it took me a minute to connect the two. <laughs> <laughs> and that hypothesis is that what is now Asia in the Jurassic and maybe the early Cretaceous was isolated from the rest of the world. And that led to lots of very different animals that aren't seen elsewhere, like mementosaurs with their really long necks. Yeah. I mean, and... It's one of those weird things where you don't need to be isolated the whole time for stuff like that to evolve. Mm -hmm. It can be an intermittent thing where it could be isolated for a couple million years. You could still have the animals migrating over. But in those couple million years, you could have this branch of mementosaurids, you know, split off and start yeah. evolving. And that once that train starts rolling, it might just keep going even once they're reconnected with the rest of the world. Yes, except that now we're thinking maybe this hypothesis doesn't work because we've got these new finds. Yeah, unless they got there in a period when they were connected. It's so hard to tell. It is, it is. But it, 
Yu Jolong isn't the first discovery to undermine this hypothesis. I guess. Yeah. If you have them like all the time, <laughs> <laughs> then it would be like, well, when were they isolated? They keep showing up. All right. So now I've got the new Hadra sword. Now you're done with your new uh, sword pod. All right. Not as good, but still pretty good. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> This one was published by Albert Prieto Marquez and Jonathan Wagner in Cretaceous Research. It shouldn't be too surprising that Albert Prieto Marquez is the lead author since he... He's a hadrosaur expert. He is the hadrosaur guy. <laughs> and this new hadrosaur was found in Big Bend National Park in southwestern Texas. Cool. Although it was just a couple of kilometers north of the Rio Grande and therefore Coahuila, Mexico. It's hmm. like right on the border pretty much. So, yes, it's in southwestern Texas, but <laughs> it's basically as far south as you can get in Texas and still be in Texas. Well, when the dinosaur lived, it wasn't in Texas. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently there are about 65 or at least 65 species of hadrosaur so far. Wow. So, what's another one? <laughs> yeah. Add it to the list. That's pretty cool. That's another fun fact about hadrosaurs. It is, yeah. It's a lot of hadrosaurs. I feel like you talked about most of them in the hadrosaur hoot, Nanny. Well, there was a lot of lumping and splitting. Yeah, that's true. This new hadrosaur is named Malifica decridae, and Malifica is the feminine form of witch or sorceress in Latin, which is, quote, in reference to the toponym of the locality Bruja, being Spanish for witch. I saw Malefica and I thought Maleficent. Yes, it's the same root there. And I thought it was a pretty menacing sounding name at first for a hadrosaur because I thought it was like the mal for bad and like, you know, mm. spooky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they might be going for evil or something. But no, it's just it's a translation of the place, but still gives it sort of a intense vibe, I yeah, think. Or like a powerful vibe. Yeah. And then the species name Deckard Eye is, quote, in honor of Frank Deckert, former superintendent from 2001 to 2003 of Big Bend National Park, who collected the type and the only known specimen, end quote. Well, that's nice. Yes. And from that date range, it's probably no surprise that Malefica was found 20 years ago back in 2002. That doesn't feel like 20 years ago, and saying that makes me feel old. <laughs> yeah, I thought you might say that. <laughs> Actually, 21 years ago. We're recording this a little bit before Christmas, mm. but it'll be 21 years by 2023 when this is released. So I guess if that find could, you know, behave, it could like buy alcohol and cigarettes and stuff. You're just making this worse. <laughs> 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 All right, so I'll, I'll move on. At the time when Malefica was discovered, it was considered to be a critosaurus, a different hadrosaur. Another lumped hadrosaur that's been split. Mm -hmm. There's some good news, bad news with Malefica. So the bad news is it's only known from a partial left maxilla or the upper jaw. Hmm. And it is pretty partial. It's missing all of its teeth. Although the tooth sockets are still there, so you can see that. Okay. And there were teeth found nearby, but they are, quote, uninformative. Yeah, that's not much. <laughs> no. And the the piece of the maxilla itself is also even more fragmentary than a lot of other hadrosaurs that we only know from a maxilla or have a maxilla of. Interesting. But the good news is that if you can only find one bone from a hadrosaur, the maxilla is one of the best, if not the best to find for determining the species. It's kind of interesting how, yeah, depending on the type of dinosaur, you just need a specific type of bone to exactly. identify it. Yeah, like I, I'm always joking about, oh, sauropods, you know, all we ever find is a couple vertebrae and big deal, and they're naming species. But really with sauropods, they have pretty unique vertebrae. Yeah, so it can, different bifurcations. Yeah, if you find a femur of a sauropod, it's like, well, okay, what am I going to do with that? That doesn't have any useful information for me. Other than how big the animal might have been. Yeah. And if you found a maxilla of a sauropod, it'd be really cool because we don't find a lot of skull bones, but you would have nothing to compare it to because we almost never find the heads. Yeah. <laughs> but in this case, it's pretty good. And it preserved at least 16 closely spaced tooth sockets that look kind of like a comb the way they're broken open because it's like half of the tooth sockets that look kind of cool. Hmm. They're also really deep. I forget how deep the tooth sockets are, 
on hadrosaurs because they have multiple teeth in them yeah. and they're getting replaced and stuff. So it's like very deep teeth. The length of the maxilla probably would have had about 29 tooth sockets in it, but a lot of that tooth bearing part is broken off. So it's just sort of like the thin upper part of the maxilla for a, a chunk of it. And based on that number, it's probably a subadult or young adult, so not quite to its full size yet. The maxilla itself has a lot in common with Aquilorhinus, but a couple of bumps and grooves differ in quite abstruse ways. Abstruse? Yeah. Like, you have to talk about this type of bump and exactly where it is in so much scientific jargon that I gave up. Mm. <laughs> but there are bumps and ridges that are a little bit different than they are on other hadrosaurs. So you've got to have an eye for these things to be able to name new dinosaurs. You literally have to take the pictures of them or take them physically and put them right side by side and measure angles of things mm -hmm. and the exact distance of bumps because there is nothing obvious about it that looks like an, a new dinosaur when you just look at it with your eye. You're like you, Unless you had been staring at these things for months, you wouldn't be able to remember these subtle differences. But there are a lot of animals today that have no differences in their skeleton. It's only in the soft tissue and our different species. So so there might be even more than 65 types of hadrosaurs. Yes, very true. Yeah, some of those would probably be split if we could see them in real life or while they were living. I guess we see them in real life, yeah. but it's just the fossils. They were real. <laughs> <laughs> it's just been a while. The formation that Malefica was found in is the Aguja Formation making Malefica from the middle to upper Campanian, or about 77 to 82 million years ago. Kind of on the older side for a hadrosaurid. Yeah. The Aguja formation has some other interesting dinosaurs too. There are the Ceratopsians, Aguja Ceratops, but you wouldn't have guessed that from it being in the Aguja formation. <laughs> <laughs> and also, yeah, Ceratops. That one's kind of a hard one to say. And then there are some Ankylosaur fragments. Ooh. But we don't know which ankylosaurs they're from. There's some guesses, but they're not the best bones for knowing. There's also the pachycephalosaurid texacephaly. <laughs> <laughs> you say you got texacephaly and a guha ceratops. Yep. And then, like I mentioned, the hadrosaurid aquilorhinus, also known as the eagle snout, if you translate the name, which was named in 2019. We talked about it back then. And then there's the fantastically named angulomasticator. Wow. I love that name. The name means bend chewer after Big Bend, but also it has a big bend in its maxilla. <laughs> <laughs> but like Malefica, it's only known from just that one bone. For a second, I thought you meant fantastically named, like there was some magical element to this, but it's because you just really like the name. I really like it. Angulo Masticator. Yeah. It's so cool. <laughs> and the fact that it has a double meaning with Ben Chewer for Big Bend yep. and the bend in the bone that they found. Although that one's a Lambiosaur, which means presumably it also had a decently large head crest. Those unlike are fun. This new one, which may not have. Yeah, they are cool. The maxilla piece that they have of Malefica is about 205 millimeters or eight inches long and 94 millimeters or almost four inches high. And that's in the same ballpark as Aquilorhinus and it's from the same area as well. So that's the one that if it ever gets anonymized, it would probably be with Aquilorhinus. But it's also for size estimates in the same size ballpark as Brachylophosaurus. So that means if Malefica grew up to its same type adult size as Brachylophosaurus, it would have reached in the ballpark of about nine meters or 30 feet long. That is large. Yeah. It's basically the only way you can get a size estimate from a maxilla is if you have a very similar maxilla from something that you have the rest of the dinosaur of. In their analysis, Malefica came out as a pretty basal hadrosaurid, which is also similar to Aquilorhinus, and it was a close relative to Aquilorhinus. They didn't include Angulomasticator in the family tree for some reason, hmm. but I think it could be because it's a Lambiosaur, so it would have been a, a distant relative anyway. Since this is basal, it's before either the Lambiosaurs or the Sauralophines subsets. Mm -hmm. It did likely live alongside Angulomasticator, though, because they said it was basically at the same depth in the rock, so that means that they're about the same age. 
some kind of niche partitioning happening there then. Yeah. Well, one of them is a lambiosaur, so and it has a clearly different tooth mm-hmm. orientation. So yeah, there's yeah. probably something going on differently with how they ate or behaved. What, or what they ate. Yeah. There's also another hadrosaur that came out as a derived serolophene in their analysis. They didn't have a name for that one yet. It just has a specimen number. But that's, again, the other major group. So we have the basal pre-lambiosaurine serolophene split hadrosaurs. We got two of them with Aquilorhinus and now Malefica. And then we have the lambiosaur, Anculomasticator, and then an unnamed serolophene. So there's a ton of diversity of these hadrosaurs in Big Bend. It really had all the bases covered if you're a hadrosaurid fan. Yeah, something about that area. Yeah, exactly. Something down in that Texas and Coahuila area. It wasn't just the Montana and Alberta area that had all the hadrosaurs. Mm -hmm. It was going on in multiple places. And it was also all across Eurasia. There was pretty good diversity of hadrosaurids too. All right. So that's three of the continents you've named. (laughs) So you know it's something in the Southern Hemisphere that's missing the hadrosaur. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Now we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break. But when we get back... Sabrina's going to tell me about hadrosaur brains. So it turns out I also have a hadrosaur story. It's a little mini hadrosaur hoot nanny. A little bit, yeah. And it's more evidence of why hadrosaurs are also cool. Why else were they cool? Well, turns out ornithopods, and especially hadrosaurs, had bigger brains than we thought. Huh. Pascaline Lauders and others published in Progress in Brain Research. Oh, that's a new journal for us. I think it was a book. This Ah. is like a chapter in a book. Interesting. Yeah. And they studied the brains of ornithopod dinosaurs, which started, they started in the lower Jurassic. The small ornithopods, they walked on two legs and they became bigger and they walked on four legs later, though they could probably walk or run on two legs when necessary, like when they're running away from danger. And they also had beaks. Oh, I just realized I might be answering your fun fact question, Garrett, because they were on every continent, but rare in the Southern Hemisphere, like we were just talking about. They were very successful in the Cretaceous, especially in North America and Asia. Well, you didn't say which one in the Southern Hemisphere they were missing from. That's true. It is funny that we've referenced that like three times already in this episode. And we didn't coordinate ahead of time. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Guess we're on the same wavelength here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Anyway, brains aren't really preserved as fossils, but you can still learn a lot from the brain cases, such as the shape and then the ratio between different parts. It is, however, challenging to, as the authors put it, confidently determine the actual shape of the brain. Yeah, very true. Because if you look at our brain case, right, you don't get all the nitty gritty details of like the the wrinkles of the brain and Mm -hmm. things like that. I don't even know if you could tell necessarily that they're the two hemispheres. Maybe you could. Maybe in certain details. Yeah. I guess it depends how well it's preserved too. Yes. In pterosaurs and in most mammals and birds, according to the authors, quote, the brain fills nearly all of the endocranial space, end quote. So there's fewer other tissues. But in some clades, how much space the brain takes up varies depending on the type of animal as well as the sex and age of the individual. So it's estimated that crocodile brains, for example, fill 50 to 75 percent of that endocranial space, the brain case. Hmm. Even as adults, huh? Yeah. Weird. And because of this, in the past, it was thought that dinosaur brains also filled 50% of the space. And that helped way back when with the idea that dinosaurs had small brains and then why they went extinct and then the, the big brain mammals we took over. <laughs> Vast oversimplification. Yeah, we've got a more nuanced view of these things now. Yeah, dinosaurs have plenty of brain for what they needed to get done. Yes, So this team, they studied crocodile and ornithopod brain cases, specifically adult ornithopod specimens from North America and Asia. That included Lurdosaurus, Iguanodon, Mentelosaurus, Batyrosaurus, Amorosaurus, and Kundorosaurus. They studied the casts and CT scans of the brain cases, and they described the depressions or the valiculae left by blood vessels in the brain case. And these 
depressions help more accurately show the size of the brain in the brain case because they, quote, appear when the brain is coming in close contact with the bone, end quote. And they could see this in the ornithopod endocasts, the brain cases. Oh, interesting. So that's evidence that the brain was close to the bone around the brain. Yeah. So the brains were bigger than we previously thought. They found that they filled more than 50% of the space. It's estimated they filled 60% of the space. <laughs> oh, that's not <laughs> as much bigger as I was hoping. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's still bigger. Yeah. So some of the findings from the study is that ornithopods, especially hadrosaurs, had a good sense of smell. The size of the cerebral hemispheres increased as they evolved and they became more round and larger. And hadrosaur cerebral hemispheres were, quote, as much if not more developed than those of theropods, end quote. Hmm. And they found that hadrosaurs, quote, had cognitive abilities more developed than previously assumed, which makes sense because you think about they lived in herds, there's evidence of communal nests, and there's also the ones with crests, which they may have used to communicate with each other. So it seems likely that they were gregarious and social. Yeah, that's true. And socialization and communication are some of the things that really require a lot of brain power. Yes. And they also potentially cared for their young, at least for a while. They probably had courtship rituals. So all these things that require brain power. Maybe they were using their enhanced sense of smell for some of that. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a couple quick news updates before, Garrett, you can tell me all about this Titanic oh, yeah. and dinosaurs. So Washington state is still working on getting a state dinosaur. And the lawmakers have a new bill. Apparently there's been a bill to name Sushasaurus Rex as the state dinosaur for five years in a <laughs> row. <laughs> it's not even a dinosaur. It's like a single bone from something that looks kind of like a tyrannosaur. It's not a real dinosaur. I disagree. I still think it's cool. Ugh. And I support state dinosaurs. The f at least there is a precedent for a state replacing their state dinosaur. Like in Texas, they changed their state dinosaur when they figured out a better one. Mm -hmm. So I guess they could do it for now. And then if they find something better, change it later. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so this bill didn't advance in the past because they didn't have time. There was other bills to consider like state budget, climate legislation. But yeah, like you were saying, Sushisaurus rex, it's a femur. It was found in Washington state. It's on display at the Burke Museum now. And their legislative session in Washington begins January 9th. So maybe they'll get their state dinosaur this year. Maybe. I should probably be more positive on it because it brings the attention to dinosaurs for the public and all that. Yeah. But I just wish it was a real dinosaur. <laughs> it's a real fossil. It is a real fossil. And they did that thing where they added Rex to it like everybody does. I think it's fine. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be a downer. Okay. <laughs> now on the other side of the world, the South Australian Museum in Adelaide, Australia has a new exhibit called Six Extinctions. I guess that's a bit of a downer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really lightening the mood here. It's a cool sounding exhibit. It goes through the five mass extinctions on Earth and then the sixth one that we're predicted to be living through. It includes a life-size cast of the largest T-Rex ever found. They didn't name it, but I'm guessing it's Scotty. There's also our lifelike models and more fossils, including an ankylosaurus skull that was recently identified and some meteorites. So if you're in the area, the exhibit's open until February 5th. And for our Dinosaur Connection Challenge... We've got a topic from Richard, which is the Titanic, as we alluded to earlier. Mm -hmm. Funnily enough, a different Richard on Patreon immediately answered with, well, you could do Godzilla versus Titanic Dark Horse comics. Mm. <laughs> and so I looked up Godzilla versus Titanic, and there is a ton of different art of Godzilla taking down Titanic. I had no idea. Yeah. I don't know if maybe this comic was like the inspiration for all of it, or maybe different people came to this idea independently. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. There is a fair amount of stuff with like Godzilla destroying boats since it's like an aquatic creature. Right. So yeah, maybe it's an obvious connection. I don't know. Some of them are like Godzilla next to Titanic, like blasting it with its 
laser beam out of its mouth and like people on Titanic like shooting back at it <laughs> with guns. But other ones are, and maybe more common, is Godzilla swimming through the water and its back plates smashing into Titanic rather oh. than the iceberg. And sometimes his back plates are like very icebergy looking, like they made them extra icy for the like there's a diorama somebody made and stuff it's pretty interesting it is interesting so i also mentioned another connection of titanic and dinosaurs in episode 413 and that is the ss mount temple which sunk two years after titanic also in the north atlantic and among other things the ss mount temple was carrying 22 crates of dinosaur fossils oh yeah i remember yeah, it probably had four hadrosaurs with partial articulated skeletons More in them. More hadrosaurs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They keep coming up. <laughs> they do. <laughs> the fossils are probably still on the ocean floor waiting for someone to come get them because things last for a pretty long time on the ocean floor, it turns out. Mm -hmm. Mount Temple is about 10% deeper than Titanic at about 14,400 feet. Just real quick, waiting for someone to get them. <laughs> <laughs> Like Darren Tankey, who wrote a whole thing about SS Mount Temple and trying to encourage people to go get it mm -hmm. and talking about how it would be like a really inspiring documentary and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm fully on board with that. Anything I can do to try to encourage people to go <laughs> to the shipwreck, <laughs> I'm just, all about it. They're just waiting to be collected. They really are. And even though it's 10% deeper than Titanic at, you know, almost three miles deep, deeper shipwrecks have been found. Okay. And it shouldn't actually be all that difficult because we have a good idea of where it is. And it's made out of steel and it's in one piece. So we should be able to find it with a magnetometer as we've done with other big steel boats on the bottom of the ocean. I mean, it's been like 30 years since we found Titanic. So things have improved too. But the connection between the SS Mount Temple and Titanic is even more direct than just the fact that they both sank in the North Atlantic within two years of each other. The SS Mount Temple responded to the Titanic's distress call. I think I might have mentioned that briefly before. Mm -hmm. And that means that for the four hours that SS Mount Temple was searching for Titanic, those four hadrosaurs <laughs> were along for the ride, also <laughs> searching for Titanic in a way. <laughs> but it was a huge, like, it, the search was really fraught with problems because the original location that Titanic sent out for where they were was wrong. Mm -hmm. And then they sent out a corrected location, I think, which was better, but they had already started going in one direction. And then the SS Mount Temple ran into that ice field, uh, not literally ran into like Titanic did, but they encountered the ice. So they had to slow down. And by this point, other ships had already gotten to Titanic. Mm -hmm. So after four hours, they were getting pretty close but everybody had already gotten rescued out of the water at that point. And there was actually this huge inquiry about it because the SS Mount Temple was blamed for not responding quick enough and oh. that like maybe they weren't doing all they should have done. And so like over the course of the years, it's gotten a lot of flack for not saving people from the Titanic. But recent reviews by historians and stuff said like they did everything. Like they turned around, they headed straight there. They did everything they could. Yeah. The next rabbit hole I went down, which was really enjoyable, was <laughs> figuring out the exact coordinates of where the SS Mount Temple was scuttled All because right. it was scuttled after being captured by the Mo, a German raider disguised as a merchant ship. Hmm. It was not sunk by a U-boat as is pretty much universally misreported. <laughs> All right. The official location is 620 nautical miles west half south of Fastnet. Because before GPS, the best thing you could do was give a bearing and a direction from a 128-point compass. Mm -hmm. Fastnet is an island just off the southwest corner of Ireland. It's very close to Ireland. And on that 128-point compass, west half south is just a few degrees south of straight west. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a really weird thing. I had to find a website that explained the difference. It's I was a, just thinking I could see why this <laughs> took a few hours. Yeah. Well, even finding that thing about it being 620 nautical miles west half south of Fastnet took a little bit. Fortunately, the FCC has a really handy tool for calculating GPS coordinates from a bearing and a previous GPS coordinate. So you can put in the GPS coordinates of Fastnet put in 620 miles, nautical miles, 
at 264.3750 degrees, which is what west half south is in decimal units. Mm -hmm. And you get the location of 49.27 degrees north and 25.47 degrees west. So if anybody wants to go look, that's where you need to go look. <laughs> Yet again, <laughs> I'm trying to encourage this as much as possible. Titanic is at 41.7 degrees north, so pretty similar in terms of latitude, but it's all the way over at 49.9 degrees west, which mm. is over 20 degrees farther west. And that's not surprising because we all know Titanic sunk pretty close to Canada, whereas this sunk a lot closer to Ireland, obviously, mm -hmm. the SS Mount Temple. The National Hurricane Center also has a handy distance from GPS calculator, so you can put in those two coordinates, and you'll see that the Titanic is about 1,120 nautical miles or 2,070 kilometers southwest from the SS Mount Temple. Hmm. So unfortunately, it's not that close. I was kind of hoping they'd be really close and I could say like, oh, there are these dinosaurs down there right next to Titanic. Right. But over a thousand miles away isn't that close. No. That does mean though that there are four hadrosaurs on the seafloor about 1,300 miles from the Titanic. And they're just waiting to be picked up by they, someone. They are. They're just waiting. <laughs> but... Those aren't the closest dinosaurs to the Titanic. There's more. <laughs> In my connection. Yeah. <laughs> the closest dinosaurs that we know of to Titanic are the many tracks and several dinosaur bones in Nova Scotia. Oh, I see. So not on the ocean floor. Nope. These are up on a continental plate on an island. Mm -hmm. They include the sauropodomorph Amosaurus, which was synonymized with Ankysaurus. And they're about 740 miles or 1,200 kilometers northwest of Titanic. So about half the distance. A little easier to get to also. Yep. So now you know. The closest dinosaurs to Titanic, the other dinosaurs on the seafloor. And Godzilla art. Yeah, <laughs> and Godzilla. <laughs> Very cool. And in just a moment, we'll get into our dinosaur of the day, Silosaurus. But first, we're going to pause for one last sponsor break. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Silosaurus, which was a request from Morgan via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. It was a Silosaurid dinosauriform that lived in the late Triassic in what is now Poland. We said dinosauriform, unless you're going with the new Norman and Baron proposal that Silosaurs are in fact true dinosaurs. You're skipping ahead. Yeah, but you said dinosaur form. I had to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looked fairly dinosaur like with the long tail and the long neck, and it walked on all fours. It had an elongated skull. It's estimated to be about the size of a large dog at seven and a half feet or 2.3 meters long. It was lightly built. It was probably fast and active. It had a narrow snout with nostrils that pointed forward, and it had large orbits in the skull, so it probably had good vision. There were seven vertebrae in the neck, and it had a narrow pelvis and slender ribs that, according to the paper that described it, were, quote, strongly crushed, which made their preparation difficult. Yeah, getting crushed will do that. Yes. It also had long, slender legs and gracile front limbs. Which were, I guess, also legs, since you said it was quadrupedal. Yeah. In 2020... Pachowski and others looked at the posture and how the muscles of Silosaurus worked and found that the forelimbs were fully straightened and had smaller muscles for extending the limbs and retracting and bending, which is something we see in early sauropods. From that paper, they said it had this very slender humerus and slightly curved bone and limited forelimb pronation. The authors wrote, quote, the forelimb can make only short steps, prohibiting fast locomotion. But they found that, quote, the hind limb seems to have been capable of greater speed. So there were some adaptations to help Silosaurus improve its speed and flexibility with its forelimbs. And it had, quote, pillar erect hind limb posture similar to that of some pseudosuchians. Uh, before the group of ornithodirons, which encompasses Silosaurus, were thought to have, quote, only buttress erect limb postures. It had, quote, fully erected, end quote, forelimbs, like early sauropods. So kind of to sum up, it had a posture similar to early sauropods. But Silosaurus also had a shorter humerus, an arm bone, and a more elongated 
antibrachium, so it could, quote, make longer steps and gain greater speed than early sauropods, end quote. Interesting. Since you were saying the front limbs moved slower than the back limbs, I wonder if it ever did like a little bit of a bipedal scamper. Yeah, maybe. But it is interesting that it's so early on and probably was walking on all fours because usually when we talk about well, early dinosaurs, we talk about the ones walking on two legs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's sort of what I was thinking too. <laughs> Which we'll get to that in a little bit. But first, I want to talk about the beak on the lower jaw. It had a horny beak on the lower jaw and a relatively low tooth count. Its teeth were small and conical and serrated. Hmm. And Zeke, who named Silosaurus, wrote the teeth have, quote, rather low conical shape and worn tips and weak serration. It didn't have many teeth compared to early herbivorous dinosaurs. But Zeke wrote, quote, in the shape of their crowns and pattern of serration, the teeth of Silosaurus are not similar to those of carnivorous dinosaurs, end quote. At the time, they thought that it was probably herbivorous. And so for a while, we thought Silosaurus was herbivorous, but... Then coprolites were found. Oh, fossilized poop. Yes, and that showed that Silosaurus may have eaten insects, such as the beetle Triamixa, and it may have used its beak to peck on insects. In 2019, Martin Varnstrom and others published a study on the beetle bearing coprolites. They were these coprolites were relatively large in size. So it shows that they didn't come from a small animal. They ranged in size from 1.2 to 2.1 inches or 31 to almost 55 millimeters long. And they had a, quote, thin, smooth outer coating and were gray to brown in color, end quote. There was an abundance of beetles and smaller invertebrates in the coprolites that showed that, quote, the coprolite producer deliberately targeted beetles and similar small terrestrial invertebrates as prey. They found that in that area, the best candidate, as they put it, who made those coprolites was Silosaurus. Okay, so it's not like a slam dunk fossilized gut content situation. It's just like we in think. the same general area. Yeah, it just seems likely it was Silosaurus. And the anatomy of Silosaurus is similar to bird-like theropods and modern birds. So the authors hypothesized that Silosaurus used its beak to, quote, efficiently peck small insects off the ground, a feeding behavior analogous to some extant birds. And they found that the coprolites were produced by some sort of medium-sized animal that went for these insects. And they said it was likely that this animal also regurgitated pellets like modern birds. So it's possible it regurgitated soft prey and plant fragments. Now, Silosaurus had some characters similar to birds with a shorter, more compact skull and keratinous beak. So to sum up this paper, these coprolites were found near Silosaurus fossils. Based on the size and shape of the coprolites, along with Silosaurus being beaky, hmm. makes it seem like these coprolites came from Silosaurus. The type species is Silosaurus opalensis. It was named by Jerzy Jeek in 2003. The fossils were found in Silesia, Poland. The genus name means Silesia lizard, and it was found near the city of Opol, which is how you get the species name, Opolensis. It was found in a clay pit in Krasijau near Opol in southern Poland, and they found several hundred well-preserved bones. The paper that described Silosaurus said there was a, quote, accumulation of skeletons. And there was enough specimens in there that so that there was, quote, a virtually complete restoration of the skeleton. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, especially for something in the Triassic. A lot of times we don't have that good of fossils to go with. Mm-hmm. They collected more than 400 bones, and that included four partially articulated skeletons. Where the fossils were found, there was a lot of exposed claystone and mudstone, and it was soft and it easily disintegrated in water. So the fossils were a bit fragile. They were, quote, prone to destruction by weathering. But still, it's a lot of fossils. And it sounds like they got them out before they were destroyed, so that's good. Well, at least completely, yeah. <laughs> the type specimen is an incomplete skeleton. 
Silosaurus, the skull was known from some disarticulated bones, and that includes the jaw bones. In 2014, Piachowski and others proposed sexual dimorphism for Silosaurus. They analyzed the hip bones of 20 different specimens and found some differences in the muscle tendons, and they interpreted that mature females had statistically larger ossified tendons than proposed male specimens. Maybe. Maybe. It's <laughs> like we always talk about, it's really hard to tell sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs. Yeah, everyone loves to propose it because there are a lot of potential candidates, but none of them are particularly compelling. Mm. The original paper that named Silosaurus said that it was a dinosauriform with the family uncertain, so we'll get a little bit into the phylogeny here. It's considered to be a dinosauriform, and until recently not considered to be a dinosaur. It was lacking features such as an enlarged deltopectoral crest, which is the muscle attachment on the upper arm. But it did have some dinosaur characteristics, like a brevis shelf. It's a bone surface on the pelvis that was where the tail muscles could attach. The hip bones were also arranged like a sauriscian. Though it did have a beak, it didn't have the predentary bone that we see in ornithischians. But it had leaf-shaped teeth, which we also see in early ornithischians. And it had some similarities to ornithischians like Lesotosaurus. Zeke, in the paper describing Silosaurus, wrote, Quote, Crompton and Attridge and Sereno proposed that prosauropods might also have had a narrow horny beak at the anterior end of the upper and lower jaws. He referred to a raised bony platform on the premaxilla in Riojasaurus from the Los Colorados formation of Argentina and in Platiosaurus from the Nolan Mergel of Germany. This is hardly visible in the original illustrations, which means that these structures are not easy to discern. And this is not the case with Silosaurus, in which the area for the beak is prominent but restricted to the lower jaw. Oh, interesting. So it's got a sizable beak, but only on the jaw, not on the maxilla. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Which is what makes it different to Ornithischians. He also wrote, quote, these similarities to herbivorous dinosaurs may mean that one, Silosaurus is an early member of the Ornithischian lineage, two, belongs to the lineage leading to both the Ornithischia and Prosauropoda after its emergence from the ancestral carnivorous stock but prior to splitting, or three, form a lineage that developed herbivory independently of dinosaurs. The fossil record of the early late Triassic evolution of dinosaurs is too incomplete to make a reasonable choice, end quote. So it's pretty interesting we were having this debate right from the beginning of Silosaurus. Yeah, so yeah, it could be an Ornithischian. Or the second one is really interesting because they said it could be a lineage leading to Ornithischia and Prosauropoda, mm -hmm. which would mean that theropods were off on their own and Ornithischians and sauropods would be closer together. Yeah. Which is different than Ornithoscolida because that lumps Ornithischians and theropods together. <laughs> so it's like another potential option for how dinosaurs could have lumped. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And Zeke also wrote in the original paper that, quote, Silosaurus seems to be close to the point of origin of dinosaurs, both in respect to its structure and geological age. And he also wrote, it shows most of the characters listed by Novus as diagnostic apomorphies for members of the lineage leading to dinosaurs. And another quote is, much less obvious is the relationship of Silosaurus to dinosaurs as its skeletal anatomy is a rather bizarre combination of primitive and advanced characters, end quote. Yep. So it's really hard to classify. Yes. And partly that's because not enough of the skull and the hands have been found. But, Garrett, as you were bringing up earlier, as of 2022, it seems that Silosaurus are now considered to be dinosaurs. And back in episode 415, we covered, or Garrett, you talked about the latest on Ornithoscolida, which is that proposal from 2017 that Ornithischians evolved from theropods. And the, yeah, you just mentioned the combination <laughs> is Ornithoscolida. Uh, the authors Norman and Barron and others now think that Ornithischians evolved from Silosaurs after they analyzed early dinosaurs and included Silosaurs. Or more precisely that Silosaurs are Ornithischians, the first Ornithischians, Yes. And then later on, we got what we usually think of as Ornithischians. <laughs> yeah. And they're not the first ones to propose that. There's papers in the past that propose Silosaurs or Ornithischians, including a paper that described the Silosaur Sasisaurus. As a quick 
little background information, Silosauridae was named as a group in 2010 by Langer and others, and there's about a dozen Silosaurs. So it's a fairly recently named group. Mm -hmm. There's still some debate over what's included, such as Pisanosaurus, which we covered in episode 354 as the dinosaur of the day. And Silosaurus lived in a subtropical environment similar to the Mediterranean today, with monsoons in the summer and dry winters. Other animals that lived around the same time and place included fish, phytosaurs, and early pterosaurs. Hopefully, Silosaurs stay dinosaurs because I think it helps solve that mystery of where were all those Ornithischians in the Triassic. Yeah. Plus, then we have more dinosaurs to cover in our dinosaur of the day. <laughs> True. We needed more. <laughs> And our fun fact of the day is that hadrosaurids have been found on every continent landmass except Australia. Oh, I thought I was going to guess. Oh, okay. Would you have guessed Australia? Yes. Were you going to say Antarctica? No. <laughs> Actually, I would have, except when you gave the hint, it's not what you'd think. Because <laughs> you would have thought Antarctica. Yeah. And then Australia is the next closest. Yep. So... I guess you might ask, what about Mudaburosaurus? Yeah, Mudaburosaurus is very big in Australia. It is, yeah. And Mudaburosaurus is, in fact, an ornithopod, but it was not a hadrosaurid. Mm. It's close because ornithopods are like the larger group that includes hadrosaurids and many other things. And one of the other things that includes are iguanodontians. That's what Mudaburosaurus is. Okay. It also lived somewhere in the about 105 million year ago time frame, and hadrosaurids didn't evolve until about 86 million years ago. So it's a little early. Yeah, it's like 20 million years early. There are a ton of hadrosaurids in Eurasia and the Americas, like we mentioned. There's just one in Africa that's Ajnabia, meaning foreigner in Arabic, and that one was really recently described. So until recently, there weren't any definitive hadrosaurids from either Africa or Australia, but now we have one from Africa. So what I'm hearing is we might find one in Australia. Maybe, but we even have a hadrosaurid tooth from Antarctica, but we have absolutely nothing from Australia, not even a single tooth. Hmm. I don't even think we have tracks that are proposed to be hadrosaurids. It's possible something might turn up in Queensland, but... I was looking into it last week when you mentioned the Lark Quarry and how it might have been made by Ornithischians and not Australovenator. I was like, oh, maybe those could be hadrosaurids. But it's highly unlikely to be hadrosaurids since they're at least six million years older than the oldest known hadrosaurid. Oh, the tracks? Yes. Yeah. So unless the very first hadrosaurids were in Australia or were missing a whole bunch of them, mm -hmm. then those tracks aren't going to be from hadrosaurids. And that's true for all the big dinosaur formations in Australia. They basically stop at the Turonian about 90 million years ago. And I use a handy Australian stratigraphy chart as a dust cover for our microphone to computer audio interface. <laughs> so I had that information very handy. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but it's not just hadrosaurids that we haven't found and may not find in Australia for a while. Because since the fossil record for dinosaurs basically ends 90 million years ago. In Australia. Yes, in Australia. That means that we're not going to find any hadrosaurids, ceratopsids, oviraptorids, pachycephalosaurids, or tyrannosaurids. That's a lot of groups. It is. And those are all like the most derived ones, but they're also some of the most popular groups. So it might be a while till we find those. Fortunately, though, it's not like Scandinavia, where much of the top layers of the rock are just blasted away by all sorts of glaciers. And there's never going to be anything because it's just completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. In Australia, there's still plenty of Cretaceous rock, even from the latest Cretaceous, hiding under newer rock that just hasn't been exposed yet. Hmm. So, I don't know, maybe in a few million years, <laughs> paleontologists <laughs> will run into it. Or it's possible, you know, someone's digging a, a deep pit somewhere for something or drilling for oil or who knows what and runs into a fossil. That could happen too. Yeah. Or on a cliff somewhere that just hasn't been discovered yet as an exposure of that age rock. Lots of possibilities. Yep. It could happen. It definitely could. And it probably will. We'll, we'll find something from that time frame. We've found marine stuff from the late Cretaceous already. Mm -hmm. We just don't have any dinosaurs yet. They're waiting to be discovered, just like those hadrosaurs underwater. Yep. I should say latest Cretaceous because 
late Cretaceous is a specific thing, mm. and we do have some late Cretaceous stuff. You think hadrosaurs underwater are a thing? You were just talking about with the Titanic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I forgot all about my earlier thing. <laughs> Once someone gets out there, then we'll find out what's in those crates. Yep. I feel like you could say that about any fossils. They're just waiting. They're mm -hmm. waiting for us to discover them. They've been patiently waiting for tens of millions of years. They don't mind a few more years. Mm -hmm. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. Again, we're celebrating our eighth anniversary of Ino Dino, and make sure you're at the Triceratops level of our Patreon so you can get our special patch. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.